first, I want to say thank you for participating um, in this Lenten journey. I, I recognize this is a choice you had to make, and there are lots of choices we can make during Lent. Over these last five weeks, 62 people from the community have journeyed with the parables. That is a significant group, uh, a significant participation uh, from our Sunday worshiping community. So truly, thank you. After your session today, you'll have an opportunity to evaluate this process. With so many participating, we really want to capture what's been helpful and what can we improve upon, as many of you have really shared how meaningful this process has been to you. Well, today's parable is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. This is not a story about the afterlife. This is not a story about eternal damnation. This is not a story about heavenly reward. And even though early church fathers like Augustine absolutely believed it was, the point is, our God is a just God. This God resurrects from the dead. This God has the final say on judgment. But that doesn't mean this God doesn't have expectations for us during our life on earth. The problem is, after an initial reading, do you hear Jesus actually saying wealth in and of itself is bad and poverty is good? I mean, it would be very easy to read that into this text through the lens that the rich man is evil and Lazarus is righteous. I don't hear social reversals and economic retributions here, though. This isn't about monetary policy. In Jesus' sense of justice, those who suffer on earth find it in heaven. Not just a spiritual peace, but a physical one. What would it look like for us to take seriously Jesus' concern for how people are treated? What would it look like to live with one foot in the earthly realm and one foot in the heavenly realm? Well, let's turn to the parable. We're going to take it a couple verses at a time and walk through it. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's tables. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The dynamic here is that the rich man is a poor role model. He has no name. He's not given agency. The author wants him to be viewed as ostentatious, extravagant, not one of us. Versus the poor man who is given agency in his name, Lazarus. We know who he is. Now, this is not the Lazarus who Jesus raised from the dead. This is a different Lazarus, but they know he has a name. He is a person. In Jewish context, it would have been socially, culturally, and religiously unacceptable to ignore the man on the doorstep. But that's exactly what happens. Now, we don't know why Lazarus is placed there. Maybe people put him there so the rich man would take care of him, which just makes the fact that he didn't even worse. Um, but Lazarus is supposed to have our sympathies. We're supposed to be on his side. The reference to the dogs for me is really interesting because it increases the rich man's negative view. Lazarus wasn't given scraps from the table, but the dogs were. And the dogs come and they have more empathy and connection to Lazarus than the rich man does. And in some ways, the dogs are aiding him. Saliva of a dog has healing properties. The rich man is absolutely painted as a horrible person in this story. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Lazarus has no family support. He's utterly alone and he died. And in the story, he finds himself with Abraham. Now, Abraham is meant to evoke for us the father figure, the protector, the symbol of hospitality and welcome. Everything the rich man is not. This is what the realm of God is supposed to be like. We are all welcome. Do you ever stop to ask, what could the virtues of poverty be? Could those who suffer the most here, living on the streets, battling mental illness, be the ones to really inherit the kingdom? Could we go so far to say poverty itself is unjust and those who suffer in it are due? I also want to name, I struggle with this whole line about um, torment, endless torment. Um, I, I, that is not how I understand God. And I think if we celebrate that, 
and we're no better than the rich man. Why does a body made in the image and likeness of God ever need to be tortured? That really doesn't fit for me, my understanding of God. And so I ask, what is your notion of the justice of God? Or maybe even who is the God you believe in? This God of punishment or a God of justice? And can they be the same or are they different? Justice has to be found somewhere. If it's not going to be found here on earth, where is it going to be? He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the toe of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. There's one thing that's really stark about this for me, um, and that is that the rich man doesn't get it. He doesn't understand that he is responsible for his predicament, and he continues to think of Lazarus as his servant servant. The story is pulling on a theme here, and, and there's the gap between the beginning of the story, right? There was the gate and the rich man's property, and it kept, it kept Lazarus at his distance. Now there's another barrier. There's the chasm that Abraham cannot and maybe will not cross to help the one who was unwelcoming and unhospitable. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send some send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so they may not also come into this place of torment. Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, to him If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Scholars are likely to assign this last section as to Luke, specifically, and not to Jesus, which means Luke is really concerned, again, with being critical of the religious power authority of his day. Luke is saying, listen, you have the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 15 mandated that you welcome anyone in need into your home. And Isaiah 58 says to share your bread with the hungry, but you can't do it. And it sets up this interesting argument. Is the law just impossible to follow? Or does God's hospitality extend beyond our failings? Is it law? Or is it grace? People knew the commandment to love their neighbor. The problem is they couldn't always do it. And the parable ends with that warning. Heed this law or suffer a, deep hunger, a deeper hunger than physical. A spiritual hunger for justice. Theologian Dominic Crossan says, We are not told that the rich man did anything wrong, or the poor man did anything right. Yet their roles in this world are reversed in the next world. What if, in the next world, this life's non-suffering haves will become suffering have-nots? And this life's suffering have-nots will become non-suffering haves? However you answer that question, it should, it should impact the view of justice in this world. There's a strain of a theology today called liberation theology that believes in the salvation of the poor and the damnation of the obscenely wealthy. I get it. The world is set up in haves and have-nots, and it is really unfair. But I caution us again. When we judge the rich man as deserving his fate, we become barbaric. And if we envy Lazarus's eternal reward, then we romanticize poverty here and now. And those who are suffering through it, I don't think would, would say it is any fun. What is real justice here? What is real justice there? I'll see you on Sunday as we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday, the, the Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey. We'll have a palm parade through the sanctuary and talk about what story it is we have to tell the world that Jesus comes to tell us. See you Sunday.
When I thought that my whole world had ended, the colors had faded to gray.